Hello everyone, I'm Vinita Agarwal and I live in Bombay, India. Thank you, Jillian, for inviting me to read my poem, The Last Refuge, which is a part of Mingled Voices 3. This poem is about um, the crisis that is engulfing man, the existential crisis, and I'm trying to take a look at what, what could possibly cause this. So this is just an attempt to summarize the existential crisis. The Last Refuge Lions eat deer, foxes eat rabbits, birds, insects, insects, plants, and so it goes, the cycle of survival. Man, homo sapien, the trophic consumer, somehow at the center of the web, throws himself out of this ferris wheel onto a bed of thorns and feeds himself to the vultures of vices. Blasphemy, luxuria, avarice, gluttony, hubris, despair, pride, and so it goes the cycle of destruction. Vices devour him, chew him to the bone. His ashes become food for trees, minerals for rocks, the last of his flesh, bread for maggots. And in the vast silence that follows, nothingness is air fed with blunders. The reduction of something to nothing, someone to no one, the final flaw of existence, the last gaff, anonymity, the last refuge. Hello everyone, my name is Joy Al Sophie and I am from America but now I live in Hong Kong. My poem, In the Present, was inspired by my trips to Africa in the last couple of years and my opportunity to spend time with wild elephants. In the Presence Elephants don't shake the earth when they walk. Unseen by day, their size is sensed by the absence of light through landscape. By night, their steps pass soundless as the moving wheel of the Milky Way. Enter the presence of elephants, a cathedral of the real, twin white spires fixed, flesh and bones standing, a living temple of the tooth, relics still breathing in the crosshairs on its last legs. Elephants don't shake the earth when they walk. An elephant shakes the earth when it falls. Thank you. Mingle Voices, three. Nice. This word nice has sprouted in my head like lice, and I am bereft in search of a more exact, exacting description of taste. Distinguished finely, sausage made by German, Polish, English immigrants to Baltimore, where Poe passed his last ghoulish gas on a street which may now house an eatery with nice bangers and mash. Indra Amitnagam for Provost. Hello, my name is Paula Karami, and I'm reading my poem, The Terrarium, published in the Poetry Anthology, Mingle Voices 3, by Proverse Publishing. It rained and rained again inside, droplets of mist, pings of breath connected. The water melted, evaporated, in the warmth of a perpetual summer. It left a void a possessive adjective hanging there. Our vacuum bubble ecosystem where the beauty of a carpet of grass, a garden of blossoms, a collection of miniature plants, fern, ivy, creeping fig, African violet, 
finally disclosed to me that even inside a green illusion of a sealed glass jar, even within the circularity of the self-sufficient and regenerating environment, even in the perfect prelapsarian microcosm of butterflies and bees and you and me, even despite the affection, the brain chemistry, the elective affinities, and whatever else it was, when your words pierce the proudly independent, luxuriantly flourishing ecosystem, the crystal clear transparency of the cracked glass revealed a perfect stranger. I'm Carol Flake Chapman, and I'm coming to you from the central Texas hill country, close to Austin, my home in Austin. And I'm reading the poem, No Exit, uh, that appears in Mingled Voices, number three. And uh, it was inspired by all of the sort of unrest that was going on in the world at, uh, at that time, and actually still is. Uh, there were natural disasters and there was terrorist attacks and it just seemed like the world was um, kind of uh, unsettled. So this is called No Exit. Where do you run when all the exits are on fire? It's not like the old days when expatriates could commiserate in famous cafes, maybe write novels while under the influence these days, when we want to get away from a country that no longer feels like home, we find that the usual retreats are closed after terrorist attacks or sweltering from heat waves. On London Bridge, they were falling down. In Paris, listening to music was punished by death. On the Riviera, they were mowed down like wheat. On the Ramblas, they were fleeing for their lives. On Mexican beaches, heads were rolling like dice. In Rome, the fountains were going dry, no dolce vita. So what about Canada, A, eh, which is looking better every day, knowing that in the end, ice is better than fire? Most of us can't really afford to move, of course. And what price would we pay for leaving our roots in all the memories that are locked in the rock, in the trees, in the houses and the gardens? And what about families and friends who hold us, anchored to this spinning earth, who know us in a way that we couldn't be known in a new land? So this is how we learn the songs of immigrants. I'm Henning Davis. I come from Wales and live in Hong Kong. Uh, this poem is about finding a place of safety, which we all need in these troubled times. Refuge, a place of safety. From the drizzled frazzle, the conceits of our eye fearing, loss of home, family, friend, for all our days. To be found, hazy through worry, the marathon ahead, the gargoyle on your shoulder, whispering strange nothings, life flaying, you are stranger. Where to find refuge in the beaches of childhood? Wave watching and finding God in the seahorses? The sea is now stranger. In the swell lies malevolence. Where lies refuge? Security in a smile, a place to lay down and stretch and wake. Your world not rocked. Your family there, free to stay or wander at will. There lies refuge, riding the seahorses who will gently lay you down. Hi, my name is Neil Douglas from London, UK and I'm going to read my poem, Empathy for the Devil, from Mingled Voices 3. The poem is about my time working as a GP in London's East End. Here it is. Empathy for the Devil. 
with a gentle, loving hand, apply the sticking plaster to my flesh wound, Doctor, and show me how much you care. Care for me with an open heart. It's all I ask for, Doctor. I am broken, I am broken, and I need you to fix me. Fix me good. Then tell me why, with kind words soft-spoken, I feel this insistent, crying shame. Would you do that, Doctor? I expect you could try to reach out to me, take away this pain, mend my spirit, Doctor. You should. You should gather shards, piece me together again. I demand, I command you, heal my soul. And I, in return, shall consume you whole. Thank you. Farewell, beloved Rover, dedicated to my father, Victor Stienberg, who passed away on the 12th of June, 2018. You had to go, for the calls of life's running tide is a fierce and clear call that cannot be denied. You left us on a bright day with white clouds flying. Before the joke you promised to tell, that left us crying. Just like your favourite poem, Sea Fever, by Maysfield, that you love to recite. You couldn't ignore the call on a sunny day that turned into my cold night. When you sailed away, some of my soul's sunshine followed you. And now, like the song of La Recarauch, everything and my thoughts are tinted blue. The wind sings a gloomy song and it's your final ship sail and me shaking. Grey mist is on my face, the grey dawn and my heart are breaking. You're off on your next voyage, a new fresh start, while leaving behind winter in South Africa and in my heart. Treasured wise words, stories, poems and songs, you left us in your memoirs precious special lessons and memories of you transformed into guiding stars. When steering through darkness, we'll turn to their light for guidance and your love will continue to shine in your absence. Farewell, beloved father. You had to go to the next vagrant gypsy life. You left in a merry, peaceful way but your absence cuts like a knife. May you enjoy your journey and next adventures as a cheerful, laughing rover, and may you find quiet, peaceful sleep and sweet dreams after the long trick's over. Hello everyone, I'm Chris Skoukis, I live in Athens and I come from Greece. I am a poet and director of the International Poetry Festival in Greece. The poem I'm going to read you is called The Ugly Side of History and it's all about the people who are trapped in the wrong side in the wrong time of history. The Ugly Side of History Johnny took everything he had. There was room for everything he had in one wing anyway and came to the capital. What else can a white boy do? but write poetry to manifest in the minds of men. And one day, when I took him home wounded, he said, one evening I will tell you about the ugly side of history. Andreas was in trouble and could not be saved, even by a drop of blood. He packed up and went to his village, but pain never disappears. It is simply archived, but he wanted to dream like everybody else on the bright side of the moon. And one night, when I treated him many dreams, he said, one evening, I will tell you about the ugly side of history. Aileen woke up soitly over a dream. She had walked places that were erased and roads that never existed. And she kept thinking, people like us change the world with a song or a glance. And one day, when I brought her medicine, she said, one evening, I will tell you about the ugly side of history. 
Angel always wanted another body, not his own. He paid every day for the stupidity and the prevention of the world, but he knew very well that love was an unlikely reality, and the most beautiful terror is to love yourself. And one day, when I saved him from his parents, he said, one evening, I will tell you about the ugly side of history. Kat had gone through illegality. She had already gone through boredom and was always searching for a new activity, a new collision. And as she was beautiful and rich, everything legal was too easy. Besides, paradise has a taste of failure, which is also its value. Kat, some, somewhere, somehow, thrown her microcosm on a pile. And one day that I remained silent so she could cry correctly, she said, one evening I will tell you about the ugly side of history. With these people, I had always the shocking feeling that I was not right. Thank you. I'm Susan Lavender, Anglo-Italian by birth, but I'm a Hong Konger. My poem, Foul and Feline, is about early 1990s Hong Kong expat life. It was inspired by a Hong Kong style painting of the owl and the pussycat by my friend and artist, Lorette Roberts. Fowl and Feline. It was 1995, Valentine's Day. Lantau was still an island, DB still a real bay. You could only reach Hong Kong by ferry and 1997 was a local and an expat worry. There were still two years left, but passing at an alarming rate, when I heard a Valentine lovebird and his beloved mammal ponder their post handover fate. The proverbial owl and pussycat sat side by side each day as a 720 pea green ferry left the bay. Same seats, in silence or in speech, they were always together though by no means birds of a feather. Two remittance hippies turned 40, leading broken expat lives. They were two of a kind, though more different species it would be hard to find. They knew England as those who do not only know her, surviving just a little longer in the setting sunlight of our harbour. She knew the inside of his head like the lines upon his face, without the need to hear his voice nor his features trace. She'd listened to his colonial ramblings from the past, when I was in Brunei, to which she'd smile and quietly sigh. The progress of the Blackburn Rovers, the latest cricket score, and more and more. They'd laugh together at unspoken jokes, complain about the crossword clues, recalling their 60s salad days, sharing the same youth, same age, same views. But now they faced their future and counted down their 90s final days. In this borrowed time and space, this goose that laid the golden egg, this very special place. Contracts ending, China coming, where could they go? They had no crops to reap. No seeds to sow, nowhere left to roam. Home? After all this time, Hong Kong was home. Family? No sister or brother. They only had each other. So they made their last bid for freedom to end their glorious final season. We won't go back, they vowed, when we're sent home. Won't be extinguished without reason. She pointed out a little sampan they might stow away on tomorrow, wearing the red and white spotted handkerchiefs he'd buy for them today, or somehow borrow. But the owl and the pussycat is just a nursery rhyme. The shape of water's no more than a fantasy. Like Cinderella and her prince, they were simply out of borrowed time. And in reality, different species cannot mate and they would never be more than a fairy tale Valentine's date. They would never be a couple, for theirs were ties that could not forever bind. She would never share his bed, though she'll always share his mind. 
there'd be no honey, no more plenty of money, no love song for this owl to sing, for his pussycat no ring. There'd be no dance by the light of the moon, for these two endangered species would be extinct very soon. Their flotsam red and white colours still sticking firmly to the mast would be the only remnant symbol left floating of their past. When 1997 shipwrecked and exiled them both on a different shore and daily ferry rides to Hong Kong with Valentine pipe dreams were no more. That's for Tom, wherever he may be now. Hello everybody, my name is Ho Cheng Li and I'm here to read to you my poem titled Receptionist. It's about my paternal grandmother's funeral. She passed away about two years back and I was asked to be the receptionist of the ceremony. I sat outside the hall and I received guests and relatives and uh, got from them the white packet. And right after the ceremony I had this feeling of writing a poem. Obviously, I miss my grandmother very much. And so here's the result. Receptionist. The clothed table had just been moved outside. I followed, seated, like a ghost. I scanned the objects on the cold white surface as in a crime scene and found the two vases imbalanced. A small piece of the plastic orchid had to go next to the frame. Rulinda had asked when the picture was taken, and that was the only question I had. All envelopes came tidier than expected, all names readable, and so I only needed to care about the cash. From 301 to 10,001, that's how Chinese people use odd numbers to avoid double misfortunes though I had a few fifties, Canadian dollars. Canadians are more immune to curses. I handed over the program, the white packet, avoiding thank yous. The guy had advised, we said, you are so thoughtful, as I did to some six groups of people in an autopilot mode. The drawer full of black ribbons we didn't touch. A takeaway menu from a nearby restaurant and a dozen empty packets with a different cover. The choking smell of lily dimmed the corridor. People all came with a film of smoky silk swaying after them like a wedding gown in a neurotic wind. The effect was nearly acoustic. A timely prelude to Messonet's meditation to be played by my brother. Oh yes, that was his wedding when the picture was taken when she was only 85 years young. Ready in 10 minutes, I took the bag inside as the men stopped coming out. I sat alone in the front. My cell phone screen reflected someone who evaded my eyes. Thank you.